All good. So I'd like to introduce to you guys Mark Bryan. Mark is a, a vet from Winton. I've known Mark for a few years. Um, I've got here, you're originally from Glasgow. Um, yes. Yes. He's director of Vet South, <coughs> and uh, I noticed that uh, your role is 50% clinical, 50% research, and 50% management. Right. So he's a big man, <clears throat> or you're a time traveller. Um, so for the, you remember the three questions? As a superhero, Mark would, wants to be captain, patient and tolerant because I have absolutely none of these powers and they would, they would actually be quite useful. Uh, <laughs> um, what's the most embarrassing thing? Do you want me to say this? Oh, you might as well. Might as well. Might as well. I'm started now. Um, although I'm a very proud Scot and I wear my kilt at all times and I can vouch that he wears it honourably, um, <laughs> uh, don't ask how I know. Uh, um, at all times, and I hate the English rugby team. I was actually born in England. Yeah, that's a worry. Uh, and uh, question three, I'm not sure whether it qualifies, but the only conspiracy theory I do believe in is that 9-11 was wasn't a terrorist operation but a US government action. So uh, there'll be some good discussions about that <laughs> later. So give Mark a welcome. Thanks, Brad. <coughs> so um, can you all hear me? I feel a bit strange wearing one of these things. So thanks, Brad, and, and thanks for inviting me here. Um, yes, I'm not a... Well, I don't think I'm a sceptic, but maybe I am, I don't know. Um, I think I was just cheap because I just come from down the road, so that's why I, I, got, I got dragged in. Uh, I certainly know from last night's quiz that I'm not a sceptic because I would have failed miserably if I hadn't had these three young people on my, on my team. Um, okay, so what I'm uh, going to have a fairly quick dash through some, some sort of my world, really. Uh, I didn't really know what you guys would want to see, but I thought there might be a bit of science and a bit of pseudoscience. I'll give you a bit of background on the, on the veterinary industry and sort of our role and my role, uh, and then we'll talk about a bit of um, stuff that we do as vets that, that is uh, it's a co coherent science, and then we'll talk about some stuff uh, that's probably a little bit incoherent science that's probably a little bit um, closer to my heart. Um, before I start, I've, talked, I've, I've, I've put up this thing about post-truth. This came out the other day, and I guess... Um, uh, I, I was really disappointed when I found the Oxford English Dictionary had named post-truth as the, as the word of the year. Every year they have a word, uh, and post-truth is the word of the year, and I thought, well, it's come to this, uh, that this is the, I don't know what the word of a year means, but it's obviously important, and I think uh, given what we've had politically in the past, uh, past 12 months, it might be true. I did actually find out that um, it was an author that actually uh, claims to have invented this term, and that was not last year, but uh, 12 years ago. Uh, and, uh, but then I did a bit, little bit more research, and I found it's actually cited in an American Journal of Public Health article, so it wasn't this author that invented it at all. Uh, and it was uh, with regard to um, anti-smoking ads, so they had a, they had a, a truth uh, campaign around the truth of smoking, and so they had a pre-truth and a post-truth outcome. And... Um, and that's where, that, that's where post-truth, um, you see that there, t-test based on the observed difference, uh, post-truth campaign and a pre-truth campaign. So even the origin of post-truth is not true. <laughs> uh, and, and it's been used again, so that's, that's uh, uh, they used it in the, um, this is in Peru, uh, in some sort of commission about uh, human rights or whatever. So um, I'll tell you a bit about us and, and, and what we do. I'm a vet. Uh, I, as Brad says, I'm from Glasgow originally. I've been out here for 20 odd years and uh, I run a vet, veterinary business down in Southend. We have, um, we have about 50 vets that work for us. Uh, there's about 130 staff and we, we cover quite a lot of the uh, South and Otago area. Uh, I've got a, as well as a vet degree, I've got a master's in epidemiology, so I'm quite into data uh, and analytical stuff. And with that, we do a lot of uh, research through our veterinary business as well. So we have a sort of research wing. I've got two masters 
students working for me as epidemiologists, and I've got another uh, qualified epidemiologist who works for me, and we've got a bunch of research students. So we do quite a lot of work in the research space. Um, and although um, veterinary medicine is a, is a science-based um, uh, profession, it's not as science-based as you would think. It's not as, quite as quackery as, as homeopathy, but it's not as science-based as you think. So we're always challenging that, that science base. Um, we have a good team. This is some of the team. Uh, those of you that don't come south to south and probably think it's cold, but it's not ever really very cold, and this is how we'd normally go about the day. Um, I use this photograph uh, to, to talk about body condition score in cattle and how you can have different body condition scores and still be quite effective. So a little bit about the ag industry. And so just, just a, a little bit more background. 80% um, uh, of our work is in the ag industry, you know, 16 to 20% is in the companion animals. So uh, the New Zealand primary industry is, is the most significant industry in, in New Zealand, as you know. So was it 40% of exports or something? Um, and yet, and this, you know, it's the pathologically averse to collecting data. And I've never understood this. Um, coming from Europe, uh, we've got a really good story to tell. You know what we do, the clean green thing and all this kind of stuff. But the, the dairy industry in particular, uh, and, but most of the prime industry hates data, won't collect data. And so um, they're, they're highly at risk. So I go to conferences around the world and people say to me, oh, uh, you know, I've heard that the incidence of lameness in dairy cattle in New Zealand is 30%. And that might be true in some farms, but it's not 30%. I can almost guarantee it. But I, have, I have no data to back it up. Uh, it's, so it's really disappointing. Um, the other thing that, the, that they don't do is they don't do this uh, value add. As you know, Fonterra, probably the single most useless organization in the country, just happens to be the single biggest organization in the country. Uh, and so and we have a role in this. Um, and I'm just going to sort of walk you through some of that stuff. The veterinary industry, I've said that, it's a wee bit empirically based, so we, we have a lot of data, but we don't have enough. Um, and it's very consultant dominated. I've got a theory, I've got a conspiracy theory on why it's consultant dominated. In New Zealand, the, um, and why farmers believe consultants and not vets. Uh, one, one thing you'll notice if you move from the UK, where vets are reasonably regarded, you move to New Zealand, vets are treated like sort of dog shit, really. And it's a real, it's a bit of a culture shock. And, um, uh, one thing you, I think that happens is in uh, New Zealand, if you want to be a vet, you go to vet school, and they've taken about 230 people uh, in the first six months, in the first year. And then after the six months, you all set an exam, and 70 of those go off to be to vet school, and the other 100 and whatever that is, 160, go and do something else. And they usually go into ag science or uh, some other sort of field of ag. And so you, you, you straight away you disenfranchise 170 people who would like to have been vets but are no longer going to be vets. They spend the rest of their life working less hours, earning more money, and telling everybody they can come in contact with that vets don't know anything and that, and that data doesn't really matter and that they know everything. So uh, that's kind of how I think it works. But we don't help ourselves. So I put up here um, dubious data collection. So a good example of that is... Um, and stop me if I'm getting too boring and technical, but uh, mastitis in dairy cows, what's the incidence of mastitis in dairy cows? We know as vets it's about 20 to 25 percent, and that's kind of you know, empirically, and that's what it would be. The only published data is 14 uh, percent. I know, and that's wrong. I know it's wrong because we published it. So it's pretty, <laughs> it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty poor data. It was a pretty poorly designed study. I mean, it, was, it, it wasn't willfully poorly designed, but it was hampered by lack of money, and so it was farmer-reported mastitis. And so we published this in 2007, 14% uh, incidence of mastitis, and that gets quoted all the time. It's the only peer-reviewed data we've got available in New Zealand on the incidence of mastitis, and everybody knows it's greater than that. Um, the other comment, uh, left displays have amazement. Don't worry about that, but that's when a, a cow gets its stomach uh, displays. This is a classic example of marketing you know, if I was in Fonterra's marketing department, so, so the incidence of uh, LDAs in um, Europe, for example, is around about 5 or 10%. So 5 or 10% of cows a year would get an LDA and have to have surgery on it. And, and that's part of the, uh, how they house them and keep them. In uh, North America, it might be as high as 40%. It's so high in Canada, for example, that most cows are routinely operated on before they calve, uh, so they don't get an LDA after they calve. Uh, in New Zealand, we don't know because we don't record, but I would suspect we have 280,000 cows that we service in Southland, and we would see probably five a year. Now, even assuming we miss 
you know, half of those, I don't know, but maybe there's 10 a year. And even if, assuming they only report 10% to us, there's no, that's no more than 100 cases a year. Now, um, I'm not a marketer, but that's a very good news story for New Zealand and animal welfare. Uh, but farmers don't want to collect the data. Uh, nobody seems in the industry seems to be very interested. Um, I put up the, uh, one thing I haven't mentioned, but I will talk about, I, I'm, I sit on the board of the New Zealand Veterinary Association for my sins, and um, I'm not very good on boards. I sat on the dairy cattle uh, board for a while. Um, one of the things uh, we, were, we were grappling with was, uh, and it's been brought up, uh, we have an alternative medicine group in, um, in the Veterinary Association. They used to sit outside the organisation, and I have some sympathy with this, with this approach. Um, and so we have a dairy cattle group and a sheep cattle group and every sort of special interest group that you want, including these sort of idiots that's in the holistic branch. And um, they mounted quite a strong campaign to, um, to be part of the veterinary association. And I, so sort of single-handedly, mounted quite a strong campaign that they shouldn't be part of the organization. So in the end, it got to the stage where the, our journal refused to publish my letters because they were just getting fed up with this um, argument. And so they were admitted. Uh, so now they sit under the... And that, you know, I can understand that. Better to have them inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. You know, I, can, I sort of get that. Um, uh, but I, then I sent in one final letter which really got them upset because I said, well, if you're going to admit the holistic branch, they called themselves at the time, uh, given that they're quite strong supporters of homeopathy, why don't you just admit one? Uh, and then they'd be... <laughs> and then they couldn't, they couldn't deny that they would be much more effective as a group of one... Um, <laughs> You know, there's 550 dairy cattle vets, and, and, and so there's... Uh, anyway, um, I, so I'm not, the, I'm not their greatest fan. I got into trouble at the last conference because um, I happened to mention homeopathy and lesbianism in the same sentence, and then they wrote a, they wrote a letter to the veterinary, to the board, and, and so... Um, I put in here, uh, values are important, um, so it's not all just about science, and I think one of the things that um, we've come uh, up against is this value. So what we no now talk about is... Um, Sarah might know, evidence-based uh, or uh, evidence-based values backed. So um, the concept of values, I think, is quite important. So people, it needs to be science, it absolutely needs to be scientifically rigorous, but there needs to be some uh, um, value behind that. And I'm going to talk about that with AMR, antimicrobial resistance. So I also chair the antimicrobial resistance group uh, for the New Zealand Veterinary Association. And, uh, and so what I'm going to talk to you firstly about is... Um, is some of the AMR stuff that we're doing. I'm going to talk a little bit about food safety, and then I'm going to dive into some of the other sort of annoying pseudoscience that has frustrated me in the past 12 months. So last year, the NZVA released this statement on AMR, which was that by 2030, we won't need uh, antibiotics for the treatment of, um, for the maintenance of disease. Uh, that caused a lot of hassle. And it caused a lot of hassle with... Um, so as a chair, that was kind of my responsibility, and I completely endorsed that. Um, it caused a lot of hassle for a number of reasons. First of all, vets think they're scientists, so they said, where's the evidence? Secondly, uh, we didn't tell anybody we were going to do this. <laughs> uh, so that really pissed people off. Uh, and we didn't tell anybody because um, a lot of the veterinary association is sponsored and funded by pharmaceutical companies. And we just knew... Uh, that if we sort of circulated this and socialised this like, as you're meant to, that it would so very quickly get dampened down. Uh, my view was that um, it was a very carefully worded statement. Um, we're not saying we won't have any antibiotics. We're saying that we absolutely need to have antibiotics, uh, but we need to make, they need to be effective. And the only way they're going to be effective is if, if we reduce our use of them, and so we use them when we need them. So we, uh, we, we, what we're aiming for is a place where we don't even need them. You can't argue with that. So people say, well, what if my dog got run over? And, uh, and they need antibiotics to, for whatever. So, well, that's right. But 2030, what if your dog never got run over? Because, uh, I don't know, there's some chip in it, or we, we can monitor it by GPS or something. Let's just think outside the square. So we won't need it. So we got a little bit of hassle on that. Um, the, the scientific argument was that uh, we have no data. Uh, and, and so the, 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 the vet said, there's, there's no data that suggests that our use of antibiotics in animals in New Zealand is contributing to antimicrobial resistance in humans in New Zealand. And that's absolutely true. There are no data. 
Uh, but the point is, how do we get that data? So first of all, we've got to get antimicrobial use data, then we've got to get resistance patterns, we've got to get it from the hospitals, we've got to get it from animals, and that'll be 15 years. And by that time, I think it would be too late. It's a bit like climate change. You know, uh, we sort of think, epidemiologically, we think uh, that there's a lot of data around that and, and that it probably is going to happen. We can't wait for it to happen. There's nothing wrong with going down this road. So this is kind of values back. There's nothing wrong, there's nothing to do any harm. We're not going to say anything's going to die because we're not going to treat things. We're just saying that how about we take this step now? So why did we make that comment? Well, and you'll see in these uh, sort of slides, that hasn't come out very well, has it? Sorry. Um, this is MRSA, methylcidone resistant Staph aureus, globally, and uh, the darker the color, it looks dreadful from here. I hope you can see it better than me. The darker the color, the greater the proportion of um, resistant Staph aureus isolated in these countries. And the, the very light colors uh, are not good, it just means you have no data. So uh, you don't want to be in Africa because you think there's no MRSA, you just don't want to be in Africa, full stop. Uh, so, so, so what do we do about this? How, do we, how are we going to measure uh, antimicrobial use? So this, this is in agriculture. So the generic way that's been done to date is MPI measure sales by tonnage, which is really crude. Um, we started working on things like uh, animal uh, daily dose, which is kind of um, analogous to the human uh, pharmaceutical industry. Uh, sometimes we use this uh, drug usage rate uh, some people use by area. This is interesting. Uh, if you look at area, the darker areas here are the um, heavier usage, uh, milligrams per 10 kilometers squared. Um, but the problem with that is that it doesn't take into account denominator data. So the Europeans hate this because they're really, really intensive. Uh, but we're not taking into account the denominator data in terms of how many animals are there. So they don't like this use. Um, We've started looking at PCU, don't worry about this, but it's milligrams of active per kilogram of biomass, which is a nice way of, uh, of calculating antibiotic use at a, at a country or a regional level. And so we published some, some data last year, or actually this year, uh, in the NZVJ. First time anyone's ever done this to look at um, antibiotic use uh, uh, in animals across uh, wherever we had data for, and the data are really hard to come by, uh, the comparative data. And what you'll see is New Zealand uh, comes out very well at PCU level. We're around about nine. Uh, we're the third low, lowest users of antimicrobials in animals uh, in the world that, that collect data after, I think, Iceland and Norway. And, of course, we published this after we made our statement. And, of course, some people started saying, well, why, why do we do What a stupid statement to make. We don't use much antibiotics anyway. So why would we want to get rid of them? I guess the point is we can still do a lot better. Um, this data was backed up by, uh, in, the, in the UK, uh, uh, O'Neill, I think he's Lord O'Neill, he's actually an economist, wrote a, a fantastic report about uh, antimicrobial use and, and actually um, uh, picked up exactly the same data as we had. Uh, so New Zealand agriculture actually sits in a very sweet place. Uh, compared to um, human uh, medicine, which is not very good in New Zealand, uh, this is Mark Thomas's work. Um, Mark Thomas is a, a, a well-known uh, uh, GP uh, doctor talking about AMR. New Zealand actually sits about third or fourth uh, in, the, in the table of antimicrobial use in developed countries. It's, it's, um, it's quite disappointing, really. New Zealanders take a lot of antimicrobials, and um, uh, most of this is community-based. So 80% of uh, antimicrobials in New Zealand are taken at a community level rather than the hospital level. So we have a bit of work to do, to do there. We also wanted to know, uh, if we're going to make these sort of statements, uh, where is the regions of, of, of issues uh, and is the uh, particular class of antibiotics. So we've just pulled, this has just been published in the NZVJ. Um, uh, this is the first time anyone's managed to look at uh, the use of um, antibiotics in, by dairy cows. This is in different regions of New Zealand, and there is a difference. Uh, so uh, there's the numbers there, if you like numbers, there's the table there, if, uh, the graph there, if you like the graph. And we've got 68,000 cows in this sample, so we've got a reasonable amount of data. We could do a lot better. And we've just started work on, or just analyzing some data from the same regions for all dairy cattle. Uh, and I think we've got 1.2 million cows in there. So we're getting the data, finally, uh, around this. But we see there are differences in antimicrobial use, and if we drill down into the types of antimi uh, antimicrobial, we begin to pull out differences between different types of antimicrobials. So 
I guess my point is that um, whilst the veterinary profession is, is, is fairly rigorous around data, it's not rigorous enough, and, and we can do a lot better, and we are getting there, and we're getting a lot better. Uh, just as a comparison, the, that's the data for, that we published um, last year. It's actually 2012 data, so we're using about nine uh, PCUs. Um, from some other, uh, this is the data that we've just had published. We're using about eight and a half different groups of cattle. And this is, for example, uh, dairy cattle in Southland in 2013, 2014, 2015. So, uh, and if you put that, just, just keep those figures in your mind, seven and a half, eight, nine and a half, and compare it to the UK, 65. Um, so, you know, New Zealand does sit in a very nice place for antimicrobial use, but, but we could do better. Whenever I talk about antimicrobial use, and the reason I mention it is because um, the holistic branch thought this was just fantastic. So as soon as we mentioned that we were going to stop antibiotic use, they, they showered us with all the other options that we could do, you know, coffee enemas and all the stuff that you've already heard about. Um, uh, but it's not all nice, and so I found this paper, okay, it's not peer-reviewed, um, so it's open access, not peer-reviewed, it's not, uh, yeah, but, because but, they say, oh, well, we can use honey, and look, uh, when you use a lot of honey, you begin to get resistance. Uh, so um, we were very quick to go back to these guys and say, we're not, anti we're not attacking antimicrobials at all, we're just saying that if you use too much of anything, you know, if you, put, if you subject bacteria to cold, uh, then all you do is select for the, the cold resistance ones. And if you su subject them to heat, you do exactly the same with heat resistant ones. And if you subject them to honey, you select for honey resistant ones. And if you subject them to uh, trimethoprim, you select for the trimethoprim ones. So it's not all uh, positive. I don't know if that's coming out very well for you guys, but so I apologize for that. Um, the other area that we do a bit of work in, and this, <laughs> I like this, is um, as an epidemiologist, is disease, uh, foodborne diseases, so food safety and whatnot. This is some data, or these are some data, I should say, from last year. Uh, Salmonella virtue. Uh, Salmonella, if you didn't know anything about Salmonella, it's always named after the place it's found. So virtue was found in, funnily enough, in virtue in Poland. And um, this was this stuff, raw meal that, um, this is probably one of uh, uh, Loretta's sort of naturopath type things. You, um, so people take this raw meal, it's fantastic. Uh, and um, the CDC uh, found evidence of salmonella virtue and it was linked to this product. And um, this is the incidence rate by date. You probably can't see that and you certainly can't see that. But there's a map of the US with how, it, uh, how the outbreak uh, mapped. I don't think it's come out very well. Um, the point about this is that food safety in this sort of world, uh, in the space of about three days, I think there was about 15 states um, right across the whole US affected because because we can transport food so quickly. So, so if you get something in there, it, it can be really significant uh, really quickly. Um, this was just, uh, it's nothing to do with animals whatsoever, but epidemiologically it's really interesting because these patients all presented to um, hospital with severe diarrhea and um, a lot of gastroenteritis uh, and they were quite sick. Uh, this is just a snapshot from the CDC. So there was 18 over 15 states, uh, four in hospital. Um, severe vomiting, diarrhea, and the isolated salmonella virtue from this food. But uh, I was interested in um, what was in it. And so this is a list of the ingredients of this stuff. And my comment to the CDC was, uh, are you sure that the salmonella is causing the gastroenteritis, or do you not think that all this rubbish? Uh, if I ate all this rubbish, I think I'd have the splats. You know, I can't see. <laughs> I think the salmonella just might just be, uh, you know, um, irrelevant. Uh, because really, uh, there's a lot of stuff in that jar uh, when you look at it. Uh, and from a food safety perspective, how on earth do you, do you manage food safety? Right, what I want, really want to talk about, um, do you have any questions on that stuff before I move on? What I want to talk about is, for my area, how... Um, so I had a really good speaker earlier on talking about homeopathy and stuff like that, and natu naturopathy and... Um, uh, we, we don't get too much of that in, in veterinary medicine, but as I said, we, we, we get a wee bit. Uh, what we get is this sort of stuff. So a lot of nonsense dressed up as data or data dressed up as nonsense, and I've grouped them into three different uh, entities. So if you're a private company, you, you do it in a certain way. If you're a public entity, you have a different way. And then there's special interest groups. And I'm just going to go through. I've got an example for each of these, and they're just they're, they're fairly pertinent. So if you're a private company, and some of you might have been exposed to this, and certainly I have, um, 
And if, if they're peddling some sort of nonsense, then if I call them out, typically they would ignore me. Um, who, who gives a shit about me? Uh, and then if, if it becomes a little bit high profile, they might come and see me. They'd be very nice. They're always very nice. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, they get very nasty. Uh, and then they, they, then they sort of try and undermine the data and they blackmail you and they threaten you. And it's a very small agricultural community, so you'll be very careful. Uh, and often then they'll either infiltrate the advisory group that you want to set up or they'll set up their own advisory group. Um, with public entities, um, it's a wee bit, they're a wee bit disadvantaged because they have to be more transparent. So, so they can't just, you know, their emails are traceable, so they're going to be very careful what they do. But they, fortunately for public entities, they're so incompetent um, that they can leverage off their incompetence and, and their lack of speed. And, and so they can just drag things out. You know, they could be, I mean, you don't expect anything from MPI or MOH. So, so when they don't deliver, you're not surprised. Uh, and then, of course, they've got political cycles. So every three years, something's going to change anyway. Th this last one is really interesting. We did some work, and I'll talk about it for a disease interest group who are very good, I'd have to say very good. These groups often have a specific agenda around one disease. It might be uh, you know, BVD or EVL or one of these uh, diseases, um, often levy funded. But they often have a little pocket of scientists who either sell tests you know, or, or provide resources. They're highly conflicted. In New Zealand, there's a lot of conflict. And of course, if, you, if, if the science doesn't line up with their science, then it gets ignored. So that's what I'm going to start. I'm going to start back to front. And so this is a, a, a saga of um, MAP. So MAP is um, Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis. It causes Yoni's disease in, in, um, in animals. And, it, and there's an association, uh, never, been, never been causally proven, between Crohn's disease and people. You might have read about that. Now, it's still, the jury's still out there. There's a reasonably close association. So we need to be a little bit careful here because it has a human health risk. Um, a group of people uh, asked us um, to investigate Yoni's disease in animals. And so we did a big project on this, so we produced a 120-page report on this. Yoni's disease in animals is um, classed as um, clinical, so animals have either got it and they're clinically sick, or subclinical, you can diagnose it by test, but they're not clinically sick, or they haven't got it. Um, but every time we look, as our tests get more and more sensitive, we find more and more of it. So where there used to be 40% in dairy cows, we can now find evidence of 60% and 80%. And then, uh, for example, in, in New York State, they're now finding evidence of 97% in, in dairy cattle uh, of the disease, of the, of, of, of the pathogen without, without disease, sorry, of the pathogen without disease. So we reviewed 350 scientific papers, and we wrote a huge big report. This was commissioned because there was a recent uh, general publication suggesting that the incidence was much higher than we had otherwise uh, appreciated. And, and we reviewed all this paper, 350 papers, and we agreed that there is probably a much higher incidence of Yoni's disease of the pathogen in animals than we otherwise suspected. Uh, and we suggested that the harder you look, the more likely you are to find it. So then we suggested, well, what if, what if every animal carries MAP? How does that change your epidemiology? So, if every animal carries it, you've got to change what you, how you view about it. So it's not a question of whether every animal's got it, or uh, you've got it or you haven't got it. So why, does, you know, why, do you, why do some animals get sick with it and some animals don't? And especially the New York State data, 97% you know, of cows had, had MAP in their lymph nodes. I just think we're just, the other 3% were just not good enough to find it. So we just put forward a hypothesis that we should change the terminology from, oh, I think this is really in, relatively innocuous. We're not saying anybody's wrong. We're just saying that, you know, what if, I mean, we've got 76% of deer have MAP. So what if um, we just called animals as MAP detected and MAP not detected? And they might be not detected because we haven't looked for it, or we've looked for it and we can't find it, or we've looked for it and our tests aren't good enough. How does that change how we manage the disease and, and what would that do to, from a food safety perspective? But that was not the answer that this interest group wanted. Uh, and, and they didn't want that because you know, various people around the room had various other interests. So that 120-page report has never seen the light of day. And it's a wee bit disappointing because I thought it was quite a, uh, you know, it's a reasonably innovative way to look at the disease. So it's never been published, never come off the shelf. You know, so that's a wee bit disappointing. That's how an interest group would, would quash that sort of science. And I think, although I'm entirely biased, it was quite good science that we did. What about unpasteurized milk? This is fantastic. I love um, raw milk, unpasteurized milk. 
Here's a list of things that you can pick up from unpasteurized milk. Uh, and this is just honestly off the top of my head. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't Googled to try and find more. Some of these you might recognize, some of these you might not, so you can get the stereo. Brucellosis, uh, TB, MAP. I've talked about MAP, MAP with, the, with an asterisk because we don't know if that's um, a, a, a zoonotic. These are things that are zoonotic, so they're going to infect, infect uh, humans. Whole raft of stuff. Uh, lots of really nice things. Uh, Yersinia, so any Yersinia species, but Yersinia pestis, if you remember, caused the plague in London. Uh, polio virus, we don't see it anymore. Um, candida, so that would be a good excuse if you came home from somewhere with candida infection. You say it was the raw milk, honey. Honest, <laughs> honestly, that's what it was. Um, the question is, I mean, I've drunk raw milk, but why would you? So what's, what's all this about? This is just bizarre. Uh, the, the single greatest um, you know, food safety thing we've done in the past 100 years is pasteurized milk. You know, why would you turn the clock back? Anyway, so this is a saga of a public entity and how they, uh, how, how, how they don't get this science. So MPI last year or the year before announced that we're going to go through this consultation process for the sale of raw milk. I don't understand. The, the government, I don't know why they would do this, but they seem to be responding to some sort of agitation that it should be more freely available. So you can buy raw milk, but there's, there's a, there was a bunch of regulations around it, and, and they wanted to free it up. I guess it's this sort of free market thing. So the consultation process as you know, is largely a sham. It means they just consult and they do whatever they want anyway. So they went to consultation. Every sane people, person argued for tighter restrictions. So the NZVA put in a submission, a huge submission. Um, I put in a submission. Uh, and then I was quite clever and put in, I thought a submission from Mark Bryan is, you know, they just, oh, he's a bit of a knob. Uh, so then I put in a submission under a false name from somebody from uh, Manukau with 12 kids. You know, I thought that kind of, you know, so I put in a number of submissions. <laughs> The one I think probably carried most weight was I pretended I was a, a, I was a, a solo dad from Nelson because I think that Nelson's kind of the hot pot of raw milk type people. Uh, and they listened to all that and of course they did the exact opposite and they relaxed um, the restrictions. Uh, but they did put stringent conditions around it, new stringent conditions. And those stringent conditions are the dairies have to be visited once a year by a vet. So that's good, isn't it? Because cows get milk twice a, twice a day for 300 days. So there's a good chance of picking up disease there. And one of the other conditions is, oh, they, uh, they've got to be clean and tidy. Well, that helps. Um, and the other condition is that the offal hole must be more than 40 meters from where you milk the cows. So, you know, I would have liked a condition like, why don't you pasteurize the bloody stuff or something? Or, um, <laughs> So they did that, and then the people that sell it complained that it was too tough. And, and, and then within, you might have seen this, and then within about um, a month, there was this news article uh, because people were getting sick from drinking raw milk. Uh, and the MPI warning consumers to be careful of unpasteurized milk after a recent spike in people with foodborne illnesses linked to raw milk after they relaxed their restrictions. And then MPI came out with this fantastic statement, um, refrigerate your milk. Well, you've read it. So that's what they said. <laughs> so that's pasteurization. <laughs> pasteurization is actually, I think it's about 50, 50 degrees for half a minute. Uh, anyway, but, but you've, got to, you've got to admire these, these people that, uh, you know, so there's no, I mean, you t somebody asked the question, why do these people do this stuff? Why do people buy rubbish? You know, why would you spend, I mean, I don't know what price it is, but it's probably twice the price for something that you've then got to go home and pasteurize yourself that's people. This is, hey, this is a good one. Now, I, I just warn you, I, there was a few gory pictures in Loretta's thing. There's a few gory pictures in this, and I sort of forget when I'm putting these things together that I'm not speaking to a veterinary audience. Uh, I've been caught out by this before. Um, so if you don't like things, then that's a piece of liver, by the way. That's not gory. That's a lovely lady that um, used to come and work for us, but this is a bit gory. Um, does anyone know about H.T. Swedes? Some people know about H.T. Swedes. So this is, I was intimately involved with this. So this is a saga of a commercial organization and, and bad science. And it pu pulls up all the things I said er earlier about how they manage this. So a um, little bit of background. Um, we feed cattle on Swedes and, and brassicas over winter in Southend uh, because we can't grow grass. Um, this is going back uh, two winters ago now, but we were, we were getting anecdotal. Anecdotal, you know, the plural, is, plural of anecdote is not data. 
uh, reports from farmers saying that uh, the, the cows weren't doing very well on this new Swede, this HT Swede. HT is herbicide tolerant Swede, and uh, they were just introduced to the market. And and, but you know, the thing about the thing I do say to vets is, um, yes, we, we must be data driven, but we get a lot of anecdote. And that's the first, as an epidemiologist, that's the first thing you start thinking, hang on, when three or four or five people in the one day have said to me this, I need to start looking at it. So in the middle of July, uh, we had a couple of deaths in cows, a lot of deaths, you know, a farmer reporting six or eight deaths each day in mobs of 200. And we would assume that that would be acidosis. So that's because they've gone on to Swedes, uh, they've eaten them too quickly, they've had an acidotic reaction and they've died. And so we did autopsies and we found these horrible, horrible livers. Uh, so these cows are getting some sort of hep hepatotoxicity. That's what the liver looks like. It uh, doesn't look very good from there, but it's a huge, horrible, swollen liver. It just jumps out at you and think, these cows are dying of some toxin. Here's the background. So just to, just to recap how this happened, and I mean, I, again, I apologize as an epidemiologist, this is fascinating for me, but it might be thoroughly boring for you. Uh, but you, you can blame Brad, because he, he, he invited me. Um, <laughs> We were getting these, so this is anecdote coming through, uh, you know, there's a lot of cases coming through. So I emailed all our vets, said, just keep an eye out on this, this is, there's something not right here. Uh, and then we started to get the W, but by mid, uh, early August, we had like 39 farms, and all of them, bar one, had this new variety. So we started investigating this HT thing. HT is herbicide tolerance, so you plant the sweets and then you spray them with herbicide. Uh, which would normally kill uh, Swedes, but doesn't kill these ones. So well, it must be the her I thought, well, it must be the herbicide. Now, if you want, to, if you want quacks, this pulled out every quack in the, in the world. Um, so the first thing we thought was, is it the herbicide, Telar, 75% chlorosulfuron. But if you go to the data, and you've got to dig into this, but you go into the data, the LD50 for mammals, well, that's the 50% people die, um, is five grams a kilogram, which is two and a half kilograms a cow. Now, this is sprayed on, you know, three weeks before or whatever. So there's no way in the world, if you believe science, that, that, that this uh, herbicide is killing the cows. But a lot of people still believe that. A lot of farmers still believe that it's a herbicide. A lot of consumers say, well, you know, herbicide is naturally bad. But that was our first thing. Well, okay, well, it's not that. What, what could it be? And then we started to look at this. So we were getting sick cows and deaths. We had this unusual liver pathology. Um, then it gets exciting. Then we said, well, there's something going on here. So we asked PGG Wrightsons if we could meet them. And they sent down three people. They sent down three people from Christchurch. So that's the first clue of what's going on. Uh, and then we had a meeting with them on the 26th. And that was exactly as, as so they were very nice. They couldn't have been nicer. And we spent two hours talking about, um, uh, you know, how they developed H HT Swedes and all the wonderful things. And they were very nice. And then and they said, and I said, well, I think it's these Swedes. And they said, well, it's not the Swedes. These deaths are not caused by the HT Swedes. They're caused, but we know what it is. And I said, oh, well, what is it then? And we always, they said, we've worked it out. And I said, well, what is it? And they said, well, there's a common link with all these farms. They're all serviced by you. <laughs> so, and there was three of us in there. I said, what? And they said, well, they're all your farms. We're not getting reports from anybody other, any other vets. Well, you can't say that's because the other vets are rubbish. You see, oh, well, that's interesting. And then they pulled out from their briefcase this sheath of papers and said, and this is the legal uh, uh, stuff uh, from our legal people. Uh, and if you mention this ever again, uh, we're going to take you to the cleaners. So it was really funny. They were absolutely archetypal. They went from being nice to being horrible. And then they went conciliatory. And I, said, I stood up and I said, well, I've never had a meeting like this. So I don't really know what to do next. I think the meeting's probably over because I don't really know how we can go on like this. And then... You know, I thought, well, actually, always better to engage. So we sat back down again. They said, tell you what, why don't you do a study, and we'll pay you. So that, the alarm bells went on then. But I said, okay, if I can do a study on my terms, let's do a study. In, and, but we've probably got about 10 days, because after that, all the cows are going to be off HT Swedes, and then we won't know. Well, so we, can move, we can move hell and high water. So we did, and we moved hell and high water to get it done. And then within 24 hours, we had a protocol, we had ethics approval, we had everything else we needed to do in place, we had a budget. We gave it to PGGW and said, you've got nine days to give us a, an answer. And on day nine, they gave us an answer. Because it's too late by then, all the cows had left. So that was quite clever. We proposed this study and it didn't happen. Um, I won't go through all this, it's fairly boring. Um, but this is what we wanted to do. So if you imagine, this is the start of the, this is the timeline. Uh, and these cows have been moved on to Swedes. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we wanted to study here. 
what's happening on the Swedes, because we didn't think it, I mean, it, it could be the management of the Swedes, it could be the variety, it could be the climate, uh, it could be how they move back to the milking platform, it could be what's happening around calving. So we need to get on and do this, and because of the way they fannied around, and uh, we weren't able to do any of that, and we were left with this, which is exactly what PGG wanted, because if we couldn't investigate the rest of it, we could never find out what the cause was. But they reckoned without um, somebody as brilliant as me, and uh, we pulled all the bits, we, we collected a lot of data, so we just carried on putting, so we, we had all this, we had data on deaths, sick cows, photosensitization. I'll just quickly walk through this data with you, and we had this mortality data, so we had a lot more than they thought we had. We had all these cows dying, uh, you know, some people had six cows dying, some people had seven cows the next day uh, with, with autopsies. We had a bunch of sick cows, here's, here's a group of sick cows, uh, on Swedes, getting photosensitization, diarrhea, and we had bloods from them. Look at, and I've highlighted all the, all the elevated uh, blood levels. When we presented this to PGG, they said that an elevated GGT of 2,500 was normal, uh, and the normal is 6 to 37. And they said, no, we think that's fairly normal. I don't, I don't see how you could say that that was abnormal. So they live in a different parallel universe to me, I think. Uh, we, we took bloods from a bunch of heifers that died on HT Swedes that had photosensitivities. That's when all the skin falls off because they're, they're very sensitive to, to sunlight. And again, I've highlighted the, the you know, elevated GGTs, 2,800. Um, we took bloods from lots of cows uh, that had been either not on HT Swedes or had been on HT Swedes. These are either about to calve, have calved, or are milking. And these are all the areas where there's a significant difference between the cows that weren't on HT Swedes and the cows that were on HT Swedes. Look at the p-values. Look at the p-values. Uh, and all these biochemical areas. So we had a lot of data. Uh, we had a group of cows where the grazing side by side. One was on kale, one was on HT Swedes. The group on kale were blue and the group on HT Swedes was red. We had a group of young stock that we, we bled before we put them onto HT Suites, then we put them onto HT Suites, and then we were going to leave them on there uh, for two or three weeks. We had to take them off after five days because they all started dying. And um, uh, this is the during, the pre is the, is the blue, so it doesn't really register. The during is the red, and then the green, after they've been taken off Swedes. So there's a lot of stuff going on. You don't need to go through all this. You, you guys can see that. But what we wanted to look at was death rates. So that's the most reliable thing. So how many cows died on uh, HT Swedes over winter? We can do that by calculating, um, because farmers don't record data very well, but what they do record is animals transported off and on the farm. So we just asked farmers how many animals they took off and on the farm, where they went, how long they were there, and from that we were able to calculate a mortality rate per 100 cows per 100 days. And this is what the study looked like, don't worry about this, but you know, you've got cows being dried off, getting put into different mobs, dying, like my little death thing, and we end up with a total number of cows, sweet days, and then they come back to the milking platform, and that's what it looks like in, in, in concept. That's what the data analysis looks like when you actually gather the data. <laughs> because it's not as straightforward as it seems on paper. But what we found, here's the, the unadjusted mortality rates of animals, and there's, about, there's a lot of animals in here, uh, depending on whether they were on... Uh, Swedes or kale, uh, and you can see the death rate on, mortal, on HT Swedes is significantly high. The odds ratio, six or seven times. These animals are six or seven times more likely to die on HT Swedes uh, than uh, on any other. Now, all the way through all this, cows were dying, farmers were getting out. We had one farmer try to kill himself. Um, uh, it was horrible, horrible, uh, and PGG maintained all the way through that there was nothing to do with them. There was no responsibility. It's not their Swedes. Uh, it was our fault, uh, or it was farmers' management. It was a bit like the tobacco industry. It was everything else but the obvious thing, you know, the, the elephant in the room. And, and it, I mean, it, all, it is funny. Uh, you know, you get all these quacks. There's a lot of media coverage. And some woman rang me up from Balclutha, and she said, I've been eating HT Swedes, and I'm sick now. I got some from New World last week, and I'm in a wheelchair. And I said, oh, shit. Uh, so I said, well, I don't think New World sell HT Swedes. And even if they did, I don't think you'd eat them because they're really not very nice. She said, well, I got Swedes and I never normally have Swedes and now I'm in a wheelchair. And I said, well, when did you end up in a wheelchair? She said, 10 years ago. <laughs> I said, right, okay, it's not quite the same thing. 
to, to be epidemiologically correct, that was a univariate analysis. This is a multivariate analysis, so this is putting in, uh, allowing for um, clustering. I mean, these cows are in groups, so they're clustered by group. So if you allow for clustering using a GEE, this is the final analysis. Um, uh, we end up with a significant p-value. The mortality rate on Swedes was this. Uh, the overall mortality rate was 0.68% uh, for, ordinary, for ordinary animals, and it was about four times for cows and HT Swedes. And after all that work, despite continually never agreeing that this was the case, um, PGG came up with a sort of a lame kind of thing. They never, they've never admitted that, um, that the Swedes caused disease. So they've never taken responsibility or accepted liability. They've never paid anybody. It cost us $100,000 to investigate this and never paid anybody. But they did come up with this, a product endorsement which said, uh, given our current state of understanding, it think, we think it's prudent that they don't be fed to pregnant dairy cows. And then about two months later, they came up with another thing that said, or non-pregnant dairy cows. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was brilliant. Um, you can feed them to dairy cows, they just must be pregnant or non-pregnant. Uh, so, and that's still there, you can still get them, but, you just, but they've never accepted any responsible. Dairy NZ did a bit of a study as well, and they found exactly the same thing. And good on Dairy NZ, I mean, they're not noted for being um, politically active. Uh, and they were, to be honest, they were a little bit sluggish in all this, but they, but they did at least uh, finally release the study, which also backed up. But that was a year later. So, um, I guess that that's a very quick run through of, of some of what happens in my world. And um, I guess my, my comment is that uh, this idea of post-truth is not a, not a Donald Trumpism. It's been, as you know, it's been around forever. Um, I think that there is, even where there's da there are data, you've got to be really careful to, to interpret it. Um, there does seem to be this belief, and you know, you'll hear this over the weekend, I mean, it's just social media, it just exacerbates this kind of stuff. Uh, we, we do get we are getting in the veterinary industry more and more. You know, I had a farmer, sheep farmer last year. He's getting abortion in his sheep, and he went to the colour therapist. And the colour therapist, um, I would like a job like a colour therapist. So I asked him what he did, and he said, well, the colour therapist, I rang her up, I rang her up, and then she thinks of a colour, and then my abortion stopped. Well, it's fantastic. I mean, I could be on, on the beach in, you know, and I could just think of a colour, but his abortions carried on and he rang her back and said, my abortions are carried on and she said, well, I haven't thought of a colour yet. <laughs> so I thought that was quite funny. But so we do get a bit of that and they uh, get a bit of homeopathy. And so, you know, but we, we, you know we're fairly immune. So my, my advice is stay sceptical. Um, I am an epidemiologist and I, I love this quote. And it might take a while. <laughs> it might take a bit longer for some of you, but anyway, that's... Um, so that's all I've got to say. I'd just like to say thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. We're running a little bit over, so we have just a couple of quick questions. So, did anyone find what the toxin was or how it came about? HT sweets, oh, glucosinolates. Um, I didn't want to go into that, it's fairly tedious, but glucosinolates kill animals and, and give liver toxicity. And the interesting thing about that, actually, it's a good argument for, um, so we, we can't use uh, genetic modification in the country. So, the way PGG made these Swedes is kind of barbaric. They, they just mashed up a bunch of Swedes and, more or less, put them in a vat of herbicide. And whichever survived, they planted them. That's because they can't genetically modify them. And of course, the ones that survived just happened to be throwback Swedes. To, because farmers are saying, 50 years ago, this would happen. Um, 50 years ago, we didn't have the advanced cultivars of Swedes that we had now. And so, so we ended up getting a throwback Swede from 50 years ago that just happens to survive herbicides, but has heaps of glucosinolates. And, and, of course, we've bred the glucosinolates out of them because they're toxic and they're not very nice and whatnot. The irony about the whole thing is that if they had been allowed to genetically modify sweets, they could have just popped a herbicide-resistant gene in there and everyone would be happy, except for the GMO people. Um, I wonder, are you familiar at all with some of the efforts being made with uh, blockchain technologies to track 
all sorts of things, including um, you know, cattle from the RFID tags, all the way from birth, all the way to, um, to the shelf label. Uh, it's the sort of thing that um, every medication that's supplied to an animal can be tracked and logged in a database that's publicly accessible and immutable and is a, a permanent record and it could only help with the data collection. Uh, so I think the question was um, RFID tags from birth to, yeah. yeah specifically uh, using, sorry, using, um, using blockchain technology, um, things like Bitcoin or probably more appropriately would be Ethereum as um, okay. these are essentially like uh, publicly readable databases that can be used for things like um, currencies okay. as well as tracking any data that you like. Well, I mean, all animals, uh, all dairy cattle have to be RFID tagged. Uh, and they should, and all the treatments and medications should be recorded, of course, whether they are or not. I mean, you know, it's very difficult. Uh, farmers are not good at recording. And, and none of that, and every other westernized country food producing nation has a centralized database. So Holland, I can ask somebody, you know, we can find out the incidence of mastitis down to the canton for every week. We don't even know the national incidence of mastitis in New Zealand, you know, so we, and because the database is held by LIC and LIC won't give it to anybody. So, uh, you know, it's just dumb. It's just dumb. My brother works for a dairy co-op in Australia, one of the large dairy co-ops, and he actually works with those computer systems, so I can put you in touch with him if you like. Yeah. We also need about $10 billion to get it up and running. That's, that's the problem. Thank, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. That's wonderful. Give Mark a hand.